you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Once we kind of slow down with everybody logging in, I will actually just go ahead and hand it over to Mark Rosenthal and Oscar Roche. Looks, we still haven't fallen in. So it's kind of slowed down. Um, if you guys want to start, you are more than welcome. Very good. Thanks, <clears throat> Skylar. And once again, Skylar and the uh, team at Lean Frontiers really appreciate you organising this and putting the effort into these little sessions. They don't seem much, I know, to people attending, but I know in the background they do take a little bit of coordinating. And thanks, Mark, for giving us the time. I, I won't introduce Mark formally. I think most of you watching will probably know Mark pretty well or know of Mark and his background. Uh, he's the, uh, the lean thinker and has uh, covered some pretty valuable stuff over the last uh, five years in my association with Mark. So when we were looking at this webinar um, and we wanted to get Mark to speak, I emailed Mark, and Mark, I don't remember the actual question, except I know I, was, I had some concerns about uh, the risk of overcomplicating various things, whether it be Toyota Carta or whether mm -hmm. it be UI or... Um, I, I think we, we uh, people who would regard ourselves as consultants in this have a habit of um, making things more complicated than they need to be, or they, we have done it in the past. And I, yeah. I wrote something to you along those lines, and you replied with this. You said, overcomplicating is an interesting topic. True advancement generally makes a body of theory simpler by combining things that were previously thought to be separate. So a couple of questions out of that response you gave me, Mark. And the first is, why is this an interesting topic? Why did you uh, this is an interesting topic? You know, there's two contexts here. Uh, one is science in general, and that's kind of where that where that comes from. Um, you know, just 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 go back in history. You know, uh, what the physicists have been Maxwell combined electricity and magnetism into a single set of equations. Uh, the, the holy grail of physics has always been to reduce everything to a single set of equations, and they're still struggling right now trying to integrate, for example, gravitation into, into, uh, into quantum mechanics. Uh, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say these things are not separate. These things are, are actually just different manifestations of the same thing. Coming around to the topic everybody here is probably actually interested in, uh, if we look at continuous improvement, we see the same fundamental thing happening, um, or actually we see the opposite happening in some cases. And maybe you know, as um, as people seek to differentiate or seek to to say they've got something unique, they maybe create a different a different form of the art. But looking at it through the eyes of scientific thinking, which of course is the, I'm going to say, it's the core of all of it, at least it should be. Uh, any continuous improvement system that actually works is built on scientific thinking. And if you, if you adopt that as a premise, then if I look at, you know, uh, TQM, that's just because that's kind of where it all started. Um, what is the purpose of TQM, right? All the tools in TQM are there to give us a sense of what's actually happening and give us a sense of when something is happening that's not what we expect, which is all a control chart does. And you see us and you see the Western electric rules get broken. You see a, uh, a point go out of control. Ooh, something's happening here that we didn't expect. And therefore we should respond and become curious about what that is in order to restore or we've learned something. If I look at, um, you know, the, of course, Six Sigma is an outgrowth of TQM. It's an attempt to simplify and make it a little more, a little more set piece, but it does the same thing. Uh, all the tools in Six Sigma are there to help us get a better understanding of what's actually happening. 
uh, if I have a really complex process that has a lot of uh, a lot of things going on and I can't I can't control variables, okay, I'll do a designed experiment. Why? In order to learn the current condition, so that I can establish a target condition about which variables I need to control. So if I begin to look at all of the different flavors of a continuous improvement. Rather than saying, oh, well, Six Sigma is fundamentally different than TQM or is fundamentally different than theory of constraints or fundamentally different than lean. No, it's not. The words are different. The tools may be different. But what we're trying to accomplish is to understand what's going on well enough that we can then see what we need to work on. Sure. Yeah, right. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And and can you expand on the second part of that sentence, the thing I picked up on? Can you expand on what you meant by true advancement? True advancement. Yeah. Advancement uh, generally uh, makes the body of theory simpler. So what do you mean by okay. true advancement? What I, what I mean is just continuing on the same thing. I think that as, as we practitioners get deeper understanding into what we're trying to do, we should be seeing what I just said is that the 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 boundaries or the, the it blurs and we start to for example um, uh, you know I'm I'm was doing uh, you know following the Toyota Kata coaching method in an organization where they had a pretty good Six Sigma background and. You know, it kind of bent their heads around when we started just asking, well, why don't you use your Six Sigma tools to grasp the current condition? And suddenly these two things began to merge into one because they are. Um, so as we look at it as practitioners, I think it's important to emphasize the thinking pattern, adapt it to whatever tools are currently in use rather than trying as a change agent to say, oh, no, you're doing that wrong. You need to do this instead. No, you need to maybe do this a little better, maybe a little more scientific discipline in how you're applying it. Maybe a little, maybe expand your thinking a little bit and looking at the overarching process you're trying to do rather than by rote. But when I say extend, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Did I answer the question? I kind of riffed there. <laughs> Are you still with us, Oscar? Uh oh, I think Oscar froze. Uh oh, I think he did too. Oh, oh. Okay. He's gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I'll continue on that while we uh, we wait for technical difficulties here. Um, and so another case, I'll just give you a, an opposite case where, again, I was, we had a team that was trying to learn the improvement kata and they um, were running an experiment and they expected the average to be better in some some indicator they were following. And it was interesting to me because this was a company that was steeped in statistical process control. They're in the automotive business. You really can't not be in that business. And I asked the obvious question, or maybe not so obvious. Okay, well, how much, you know, you've got some variation there. How much better does it need to be? Does the average need to be to know you've actually made a difference? And what I'm asking them to do is a simple statistical t-test between the two numbers that tell you, you know, whether you have a statistically significant um, difference or not. And uh, it was like over their heads because in their minds, they had segmented the statistical process control that they knew from this Toyota Kata thing that we're learning. And that's really, you know, that's what we're trying to say. No, it's the same stuff. And that was that was kind of my point. So as they learned, they should be then understanding that we're integrating, we're, we're combining these two, two structures into into one. I go to classic lean. Um, and it gives you the same basic stuff. Um, I look at standard work. 
The purpose of standard work is so that the team that is by the team for the team so that the team performing the work cycle can detect if they get knocked off it. They can say, oh, wait a minute, we couldn't follow our work cycle this time. Why? Well, because this happened or that happened and it got in our way. Um, and so that gives us an opportunity to learn to say, what do we need to understand here? And then work to remove that source of instability, which I might say in lean. But guess what? If I were using Six Sigma language, I would say to remove that source of variation. So we want the work cycle to be consistent. That means we want to remove variation from the work cycle. We want it to be stable. We want it to be consistent so that we can detect sources of inconsistency, detect sources of variation, detect sources of instability, depending on whichever body of knowledge you're coming from, but it's all the same stuff. And that was kind of what I was trying to get to. So continuing to riff here, um, there's a, what am I going to say? I'm back. So, ah, he's back. Okay. So I was just continued on the topic there, Oscar, and uh, brought on, up yes. a couple of other so, examples. Rather Australian than internet, in, I apologize. Yes, waiting an awkward silence for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, your internet's upside down. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't help. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. So I, I was just con continuing on the last question you asked, which was how how we in what integration actually looks like, or yes. what separation looks like uh, in the case of you know an organization that for whatever reason in their minds had firewalled statistics from uh, from, from basic problem solving. Sure. Thank you. So uh, there's one thing you said that I thought was important, in, you know, five minutes ago, and maybe the uh, Toyota Carter people might have picked up on this. You, you said that um, in your experiments, you conduct experiments to help us learn the current condition. You, you know, in the Toyota Carter pattern, experimentation is step four, um, current condition is step two. So in theory, if you if you follow that pattern, you've already understood current condition when you start experimenting. But I think I understand what you're getting at by saying experiments help us learn the current condition. Can you expand on that a little bit, please? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm using the jargon of, of statistics there or of, of uh, uh, Six Sigma, you know, a design of experiments, the DOE designed experiment is yep. a specific way to actually grasp the current condition to understand I'm going to run experiments, I'm going to collect data, but my purpose is, is to understand the how a, a group of variables that I can't control separately interact with each other. Um, and so, and, and a lot of experiments are information seeking. And even in Toyota Kata, we talk about sometimes you're sometimes you run an experiment just to learn more. And yes, so, yes, yes. you know, the boundary between current condition and, uh, and experiments is a little blurrier than it maybe it shows up in the four boxes. Yeah. And I think that's that's an important element of all of the Toyota Kata pattern, uh, of all of the, the Toyota Kata patterns. The Toyota kind of pattern is that um, is the is the experiment itself moves you for the experiment itself moves the current condition in some ways or moves your understanding of the current condition. Yeah, and that's what exactly. we often say. You know, just choose a target condition and get started because it's when you get started by the experiment that you'll really start to learn. That sort of ties in with that. I feel. Yeah, I, I, I just to, on that, just to dive into Toyota Kata a little bit, I would recommend having enough understanding of the current condition that you can narrow your focus rather than pulling a target out of the air. Yes. Uh, just because, uh, you know, the challenge gives direction, the current condition narrows your focus and the target condition gives you permission not to try to fix it all at once. And well, we don't want to be completely oh. arbitrary with that. <laughs> I think that's probably an important last 20 seconds in what you just said then. I might replay the recording later and write that one down. <laughs> I suspect that was key. Um, we've got a, some people submitted some questions, okay. Mark, during, uh, that when they sub 
you know, registered for this. And the first one I was going to raise was from Miss Witt in Vietnam, but I think you've answered it. She says, can you tell me what is true, the true meaning of integration and what successful integration looks like? I think you've asked, answered the first part, but if I'm looking from the outside, what does successful integration, all these things look like? If I'm looking from the outside in. Um, I'm going to hear a seamless conversation, bringing in whatever techniques or tools or whatever that are pertinent to what we're trying to accomplish right now. And I am, and really what I'm not going to hear is discussion about whether this is lean or Six Sigma or, uh, and I'm not going to hear things like, well, lean is a, focuses on waste, which it doesn't. And Six Sigma focuses on variation as though, you know, the Toyota production system doesn't look at variation, you know, they obsess on it. Yes. Uh, and so I'm going to, he I'm going to, I'm going to sense an understanding that, um, that there isn't a fundamental difference here. And I'm not going to see what I call the theological wars. Yeah, so you can be practicing scientific thinking without saying, now what's the current condition or what's our target condition without the, what I think you're saying is you don't necessarily have to be hearing those key words to be wit to witness the practicing yeah. of uh, scientific thinking. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to see scientific thinking and hear the scientific thinking in the language, and yes. then I know we're I know we're there. I'll just give yeah. you a, 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 you know I, I when I worked at a large company that had, I mean it was interesting because we had camps and this is you know back in uh, the early two thousands there was the brand new you know uh, TPS lean camp. There was an established Six Sigma camp, and then you had little little pockets of the 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 uh, theory of constraints folks and the GE workout folks, and and two or three others that were even more obscure, and they were all fighting with each other, saying our way is the only way, yeah, and right. that wasn't that wasn't productive. No, that'd be quite counterproductive, I imagine. Yeah. Spot on. Um, now, the second question that I would that I thought is well worth bringing up is from Terry Henry, and Terry says, "How do you get an organisation to go from constant evaluation to simple execution? In other words, they want to ID the problem and not fix it. So, how do you go from constant evaluation to simple execution?" Uh, you know, in what are you trying? Yeah, let me back up know where you're trying to go. Um, so I see that a lot where people say, oh, we need to be lean. Well, okay, but why? You know, why are you doing yeah. this at all? And so I think having an objective, having a challenge in Toyota Kata terms, but having a goal of some kind uh, says that tells us why we're doing it. You know, I go back to, uh, um, you know, space travel and my favorite topics back in the 60s, right? The goal was to land a man on the moon and return sure. him safely to the earth because that part's important too. And so that that actually focused the effort that had been going on for a decade to, okay, what do we need to do to get that done? <coughs> and the, I think that uh, from a business point of view, it's a, it's a, it needs, it's important and you might want to comment this. It's not something that we'd like to be able to do. It's something that we have to challenge. The goal needs to be something that we have to do this. Otherwise, the consequences for the business are not going to be good. Yeah. I, What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't like the burning platform metaphor because all you, know, you have, a, you know, if it's that urgent, people just want to get off the platform. Um, but it clearly needs to be something that the organization feels that you know, in a good way, right? It's not, you know, when I say, when I say something we have to do, what I'm looking at is the goal itself might be, hey, we really want to get here. Now, what must we improve to be yeah, able right. to reach that level of performance? And it's important because so many times and so many of us have been taught to look at a process and say, what can we improve? And then we'll just make all these changes and say, see how much better it is. 
uh, yeah. but you know, but but f to what end, right? Hey, we freed up all this floor space. Well, that's wonderful. Um, doesn't change anything other than we have yellow tape around a bunch of floor space. Yeah, yeah, right. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Phil Draper submitted a question, and he's his question is: How do you know you have combined too much? Is there a risk of oversimplification? Hmm. There's that famous quote attributed to Einstein, and I say that these days because it's hard to know. You know, where everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, and I don't run into oversimplification. Well, give me back up. Yes, you can oversimplify. That's that other saying: all models are all models are wrong. Some are useful. Um, so, if I were to actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up a bit. Try to oversimplify it because at some point you'll simplify to the point where something breaks, and then just go back one. Yeah, good um, point. And, I like that. And, and I would do that with the process itself, right? Okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna keep doing. We're gonna keep simplifying this process. We'll keep doing flow, for example, yes. until it can't, and then back up one, figure out what that problem is, and that tells you the threshold of works and doesn't work. Sure, I, I like that thought because um, the because that gives the focus on simplification if you like rather than the focus of removing removing waste and you can right. almost you can be absolutely sure that when you simplify you will have removed waste there will be no other way than to because waste just complicates things generally yeah yeah, yeah. Would that be waste, a fair comment yeah yeah waste comes out as a consequence of yes. getting the work to flow but if yes. you would try to attack it directly you can end up painting yourself into a corner yeah exactly exactly uh, Andre Santiago submitted a question, and I, it's one that comes up a lot in uh, many different forums or contexts. But he says, <laughs> "How does how do you apply this? I presume he means Toyota Carter, but how do you apply it with no support from management? How can we approach upper management to get to them to buy into the culture?" That's two separate questions, actually. Yeah, it is. That's right. Uh, so go to the first one. How to apply it with no support from management? Just do it. I mean, honestly, um, yeah. unless they're unless they're in directly impeding you, then you know, which is a huge a, problem. Which is a huge problem. Um, but usually, people have some degree of autonomy within their work and. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from trying to find ways to do it better um, and just just do that. Um, now, there'll be a limit and you start getting cross-functional. It can get difficult. But, you know, one of my mantras for change agents is what you can where you can. Yes. And, 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 and then start pushing the boundaries a little bit, you know, just start nudging. And then you can start going to other people and saying, hey, you know, if we worked on this together, we might be able to solve this problem. And you could get a lot done that way. Um, yeah. And that kind of leads to the second one in a way, because if you can create a bright spot or an outlier, maybe, and it doesn't work every time, but maybe somebody will up, up high will say, hey, uh, you know, what's going on down there? Because it looks different. Exactly. Um, now, I see there's a person that online, Mark Hampton, who's brought up a question to do with Agile. Yeah. The question from a Sean Shepard, who's brought up a similar question. How can we avoid confusion while promoting Agile and the improvement Carter simultaneously? I might have a crack at answering that comment. Sure. My understanding of that um, is that Agile is a Toyota, Car the improvement Carter, the coaching carter are ways of learning to think with agility. So, uh, you know, being agile is an outcome or is an endpoint, and the Toyota carter patterns are a way of learning or one way of learning to uh, think with agility or be agile. Would that be a fair comment? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so, uh, and I, honestly, I have one and only one solid benchmark of agile. And that's Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor. 
And yes. it's not a good benchmark for me because they're doing it in a splendidly spectacular, awesome way. So, uh, um, which is not and, the majority. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah it's not the majority. Um, and when I read the book and when I visited the company, and I'm now a pretty good friend with uh, with Rich Sheridan, um, what I saw there, and it's actually kind of the genesis of this whole discussion, what I saw there was, no, they don't do Toyota Kata. Absolutely not. They didn't have me even heard it. Well, they had heard of it because they know Mike uh, Rother. But they do, because if you listen to their daily language, it's let's run the experiment. It's let's try it. It's let's see what we can learn. They are applying the mindset of scientific thinking. And if you go back to their origin story, they had a specific problem to solve. We're late. Uh, we're spending yeah, a lot of time, you know, write, rewriting code. We're spending, we, we are working 60 hour weeks. We're miserable. And that was the problem that they set out to solve. And they found this thing called extreme programming and they kind of built a, um, you know, built their system around that, and, which is a flavor of Agile. And they ran experiments in order to figure out how to make it work ran experiments to figure out how to get, you know, um, developers who are typically used to working alone uh, to work in pairs. And, and so they experimented their way into it. If you just read the book and try to impose the structure on an organization that doesn't have it, good luck with that. It's a fundamental mm. culture change. Sure. And changing culture requires going slow, running experiments, and learning how people ad adapt. Yeah, yeah. I um, I, I was interested in what you just said. Then, you know, the use of the word experiment as opposed to let's try it. One of the view, one of the um, barometer, one of the uh, measures I use. I think sometimes is if I'm still here, if I hear the word experiment, I'm thinking they're still stuck in Toyota Carter mode. If I hear them, people saying, oh, let's try that, let's try it. And it's based on something that they've just learned, then I know they're starting to think scientifically. So there's a subtle difference between the word experiment and let's try it, I believe. I find in, in, in trying to see how well think people are starting to integrate this stuff. Um. Yeah, well, you know, experiment is certainly part of Toyota Kata jargon. Um, Absolutely. And, and it's part of Menlo's jargon, too. They, they developed it separately. Let's run the experiment is, is actually something you hear there. Um, when I was learning lean, what, I, what my, uh, my late friend Hal called lega calls legacy lean, um, we had this thing called a Kaizen newspaper, which was really just an action item list. And it was... It was idea. It was a list of ideas that we're going to we're going to do essentially with the objective yeah, right. of hitting some goal. Um, what wasn't there typically was a retrospective of I'm going to take this action. I'm going to put this change into place, and then I am going to do so predicting the effect I think it's going to have, and then I'm going to observe the effect that it has, and I'm going to learn from that. So. Yeah. We didn't, we had one of our senseis actually had us hand draw another column on the Kaizen newspaper that, that asked us to predict the effect and asked us to review it. He actually created, had us create an experimenting record out of a Kaizen newspaper. And this was back in, I want to say 1999, 2000 or so. Yeah. Right. Um, um, we didn't call it an experiment. But you got to no. think like an experiment, and that's where I want to get to. Is how are yes, they thinking? Sir. Yes. Let's say yeah. one more thing on that, um, if I may. Yep. Of if course. I go to a typical staff meeting, we have action items. Yep. And what I tell people is, if you want to start engaging scientifically, just use the at least the verbal structure of the Toyota Kata um, experiment record as your action item list, rather than saying, okay, I'll do this report back in, th you know, in three weeks, it's either done or not done. Don't <laughs> let an action item go, go past reporting out at whatever your next meeting is. 
So what are you going to have done in a week rather than what are you going to have done in two months? And then make a prediction and then test it. Okay, we took the action, yes or no. Did we get it done? Okay, we did. Did it, we do it the way we said? Yeah, confirmation check. Okay, what was the effect that we had? And was it the effect that we wanted? That question gets asked so rarely in staff meetings, it's almost scary. Yeah, right. And say that question again, please. I know people will pick their ears up to that. What was that question? Um, it, it's what did what act, did we get the effect that we intended to? Yes. Did we accomplish what we set out to do with that action item? So many action items are what we in the military would call fire and forget. They are, we just launched them off and then we never look back. And, and I think the important thing there, Mark, and you may wish to comment again, we're nearly out of time, is that if you didn't get the effect that you anticipated, that's not a pro that's not wrong. No, it's learning. And exactly. I want to comment on Raghavan's question here, if I may, because he asked if you <clears throat> don't have a storyboard, you aren't practicing Toyota Kata. Sure. And how to get management back to the idea. And, and, and I know Raghavan pretty well. And absolutely. So Toyota Kata is a specific structure for learning. Um, and... So if you're going to use it as a practice structure, please use it. You know, and it's kind of like martial arts. There's different, you know, if, you, if I go to kendo, there's ryus, right? There's different, there's different, different techniques that are used to do, to do the same thing in, uh, in uh, um, you know, in kendo or in aikido or in any of those. There's different schools. And if you are using the kata from one school, you are not practicing in the way of the other school. You can't say you are. And so Toyota kata in reality is a school. It's a set of practice routines. And there's other practice routines that work. Yes. Exactly. But if you're using different practice routines, don't call it Toyota Kata because you're not doing it. Yeah. Makes good sense, Mark. Um, time's up. <clears throat> I just realized my video was that must have been on reconnected. I apologize to everyone. That's all right. I um, figured you had bad bandwidth. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't why. When I reconnected, it must have defaulted to that. So, Mark, thank you. I always enjoy uh, conversations with you. I enjoy listening to what you had to say, and I trust the people that joined us live. There was a baby, which is terrific. Uh, I trust they enjoyed it as well. And as Skylar said, the recording will go out to the other 250-odd people. Okay. If so anybody so, wants to uh, shoot an email, mark at theleanthinker.com is a good way to reach me. Good on you. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the time you've put into this and appreciate the little bit of preparation we did, but honestly, not that much. So um, thanks again, appreciate it. Sure thing. Slim Frontiers. Care. Thank you, Oscar and Mark, and thank you to everybody who joined today. And just to hit on what Oscar said, there will be a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you to everybody, and thank you again, Mark and Oscar. We'll see y'all later. Thank you, and I apologize for the internet blip I had. Sorry. Oh, no worries, Oscar. <laughs> okay. See ya. Bye, everyone. Bye.